Be a holy people. Be a people that are set apart unto himself. And we're not to look like the world. We're not to act like the world. We're not to behave like the world. We're not to do the things of the world. We're to be holy unto him. It's very clear, very very precise. And God's very very explicit about that. He, he gives no punches about that. He says, I desire for you to be holy. I desire for you to be right with me. When I looked up the word holy, it just simply means to be like God, to, to be holy. Timothy chapter number 3. Take your Bible as you would and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy. I'm going to preach a message and a topic that I'm sure everybody's heard, but I want to try to apply it to our hearts and lives as we try to live this life, try to live in a world that's compromising, that's living in a world that's falling away, if you will, that's giving up, giving in, or giving out. And I, I don't want to be that way. I want to live for God to the very last. I want to be a good soldier, as Paul said to Timothy, be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, be to the end. And there's a way we can do that. You know, we can win, by the way, not only just in salvation, we can win the Christian life. And God intended us to do that. He intended us for to live victoriously. He intended for us to be on the winning side, heavenly, but also earthly. We can do that. And so 2 Timothy, he's writing to the young Timothy. Timothy is now pastoring the church that Paul started. Paul started these churches. He wrote 13 New Testament books, and he started many churches on his journeys. And when he'd start a church, he'd get it established, and then he'd put a man in that church to pastor it. And the church would elect them, and they would go on, and Timothy is that young pastor. Timothy is that young pastor that Paul put there, and he's writing these letters to Timothy and trying to help him pastor that church. And it's encouraging to me, we call them the pastoral epistles. That's how we got the name, pastoral epistles, because it's sort of what the pastor would need to follow as he pastors the church. And so this letter is to help me, and so I appreciate God doing that. But let read with me here just for a few minutes as we read 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and notice this, unholy. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered. Verse 12, Yea, all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now that's a profound portion of Scripture. And if we could just process all of that in our setting this morning, we'll do well. <laughs> but I want to preach a message to you this morning on how to live holy. Now when you hear that word, and I, in my first initial study of this, I thought, you know, being holy, that, ugh, wait a minute, that makes me flinch. That makes me step back and say, whoa, now, Lord, I, that's a big word. That, that's a big word that I can't hone up to, to live holy. I mean, to be, to live a holy life. And 
It almost seems as that terminology is so far out there in the future or is so distant that we can't capture that. that that's, that's beyond us, Lord. But he tells us very plainly and very specifically that he wants us to be holy. He desires that his people be a peculiar people, be a holy people, be a people that are set apart unto himself. And we're not to look like the world. We're not to act like the world. We're not to behave like the world. We're not to do the things of the world. We're to be holy unto him. It's very clear, very, very precise, and God's very, very explicit about that. He, he gives no punches about that. He says, I desire for you to be holy. I desire for you to be right with me. When I looked up the word holy, it just simply means to be like God, to, to be holy like God. You know, it's a strong word, and we often flinch at that. We often back up because we get the idea that being holy is an outward expression, is an outward behavior. The truth is, being holy is not outward at all. Now, there's no doubt a byproduct of being holy and it's outward, but holiness starts with the inside. Holiness is all about what's on the inside. It's not about what's on the outside. Being holy, we, also, we always, and I, I'm guilty of this, uh, of attaching being holy with some type of outward appearance. That's not holiness. Just because there's a denomination somewhere, just because there's a title somewhere that says holiness does not make it holy. <laughs> Just because it has a name, just because it has some sort of cliche beside it does not make it holy. Just like a man standing in a garage does not make him a car. Just because you're in something does not make you that. But I do think we find out of these portions of scriptures and many others that God desires that we be holy. How can we be holy? Now, I'm not talking about our nose stuck up in the air, and I'm not talking about a haughty spirit. I'm not talking about holier than thou. You know, we've all heard that. I'm not going to go to that church because there's holier than thou. Or if you do right, or if you live, try to live honest in a crooked world, and you try to just do right, they're going to say to you, holier than thou. You know, you may have been accused of that. You may have had someone say to you, you're just holier than thou. Well, that's just because you don't cuss or drink or, or go to the bars or do whatever. They think you're holier than thou. Well, we understand that's not the case. We understand that's not where how to behave. We don't walk around with our nose stuck up in the air and, uh, you know, cause people to think we're better than them. That's not it at all. That's not it at all. But I do know this. As you grow closer to God and as you draw near Him, He will make you holy. Amen. It's sort of like being near a fire. If you get cold and there's a big blazing fire in front of you, it just makes sense to draw close to it, doesn't it? Because I want to be warm. Yeah. Same way with God. If He desires for me to be holy and He desires me to live my life holy, well, how can I be holy? How can I get holy? Just get near Him. Yeah. And I promise you, getting near God, drawing near Him will make you holy. I promise you this also. If you get near God, you won't have to worry about a bunch of riffraff coming around. If you get near God and you just get God's grace on you and God's purpose on you and God's favor on you, the world's going to see it and they're going to fear. Not in, not in a, 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 a distant fear, but it's sort of something different about that individual. There's just something different about that guy right there. I mean, he walks into a room or he walks into a certain place and he's got God on him and he's got, and he's got an individual that, that just set apart. And by the way, that's just not for the preacher. Let me say this real clear. I'm not talking about just the preacher. I'm not talking about just somebody that says he's a preacher. I'm talking about the Christian individual at work. You're sitting at the factory on Monday morning. You're, you're on the job Monday morning. That very thing applies to you just as it does to me. Amen. And so much the more, I think. Do you know, I believe this all in my heart. I appreciate folks and appreciate their kindness when it comes to the pastoral position. But you know the truth is, the people of this church preach a far greater message than I do. You and your everyday living, you and your uh, encounters throughout the day, you living your life for God. You see, there's more of you than there are me. There's more of your influence than I am. There's no way that I could touch a third of the people that you touch on a daily basis. I said this the other day. I said if every person that make up Twin City Baptist Church just reached one person for God, we'd have to, we'd have to meet at the park. Because we couldn't all fit in here. My point is this. 
God set up the, the principle of being holy for the Christian. He says in Leviticus 10, 10, he says that you might put a difference between holy and unholy. So God makes it very clear that he wants us to live a holy life. Matter of fact, I want to go to Leviticus. If you hold your place and go back with me to Leviticus chapter number 11. Would you turn over there, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus number 11 and verse 44. And please, I'm trying to make it very clear that we're not trying to be holier than thou. We're not trying to stick our nose in the air. This is not that message. Please don't misinterpret that. Please don't get the idea that preacher wants us to make us something we're not. No, I'm not. I want you to be who you are for God. But I do know that God wants us to draw near Him. And He tells us very, very clear. He says, Leviticus number 11, verse 44. He says, For I am the Lord your God. And ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves. Here it is. And ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourself with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God says, I want you to be holy. I don't want you to defile yourself. I want you to remove yourself from things that will hurt you, that will defile you. I was thinking this morning, of course, most of you know today, Charity and I was Wedding anniversary, we've been married 18 years, and so she's been looking through some pictures and all, and the girl's been out getting the wedding pictures, and there's one when I first met Charity when she was 18, and she looks for all the world just like Emily. And Emily came in the room, and I said, Emily, that's going to be you when you're 18. If you want to know what you look like, this is you right here. Because children resemble their parents. Children resemble who they're following. Same way with God. If you want to resemble God, if you want to be that holy person that God desires for us to be, then we got to get near Him. Dr. Curtis Hudson, when I think about this holy and unholy thought, what Dr. Curtis Hudson said, things that are different are not the same. That's profound, isn't it? <laughs> you know, there are differences in life. There is a difference between being honest and being a thief. Am I right? There is a difference between truth and a lie. There is difference between, between things that are drunken and things that are sober. There are things different, but the light from dark, on and off, uh, uh, wet and dry. There are differences, and until we get to the place in our life where we're going to decide, I'm going to do that which is right, not to achieve something with man. And there's another thing that we get the idea that holiness is between men. It's not. It's between God. Amen. See, it becomes hypocr hypocrisy when we try to be holy with people. That's not going to work because that's hypocrisy. If I come into your presence and I try to act like I'm holy, well, that's going to be sickening. That's going to be gross in the minds of people. If you try to portray that you're holy, you forget it. You're just going to be repudiating in the sight of people. But if you get along with God in humility, walking with God and striving to be like God and do what God says to do, I promise you in authority of this book, He will make you holy. Amen. He will cause you to have a countenance about you. I love that story when Moses goes to the, uh, the Mount Sinai and God calls Moses a great picture of the Christian life. God calls Moses unto Himself. And God says to Moses, and I want you to lead the people. Before you lead the people, I want you to come to the Mount Sinai, Mount, and, and I want you to give you the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says he spent time with God. And when he spent time with God, he came down from the mountain. And the Bible says all the children of Israel saw his countenance. And the Bible says his face shone like the countenance of God. He had been time with God. He spent time with God. And when he came down, everybody knew it. Moses didn't have to come down and say, Woo, I've been with God. I've been with God. You ought to get to where I've been. I've been with God. He didn't have to say that. He didn't say one word, but everybody knew it. I'm going to tell you something. When you get around God, you won't have to tell people you've been around God. They can smell it. I love that garden. I love that song, Been in the Garden. In the rose garden. And when you get in that rose garden, you stay around those roses, you get that sin on you. I've been having to run my, I've been having to run these young people out of my office. Because they said they love the smell of my office. I said, get out of here. They said, we're just in here breathing. They'll have that, they'll have that lacquer scent on them, won't they? If, they? if they have lacquer scent, it's because they've drugged that smell out of the office in here. 
I'm just simply saying, you've been around a fire, and you get that sin on, you can smell it, can't you? Whatever you hang around, whatever you're around, you're going to get it on you. Same way with God. You, you get around God, you get to the place where you desire to be what He wants you to be, it changes you. He tells us, verse number 3, go back to our text, He says, this snow, He's given us a fair warning, it's time to be holy. It's time that we live a set-apart life. And by the way, let me say this, it's not your dress that makes you holy. It's not your attire that makes you holy. It's not what you put on. It doesn't make the closet make you holy, it's the heart. It makes the heart. It's the heart. God, could, God, God condemned the Pharisees and the scribes. And the Bible said they loved to stand on the street corner and make long prayers, their petitions. They loved to stand on the street corner and let everybody see them that they were praying. And the Bible says that was stinking the nostrils of God. Same way here. He says, know this though. Know this. That men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And all those lists of negatives he gave us was because don't do those because you're going to live an unholy life. One man said most of our struggles as a Christian is not only trying to find holy things, but to follow holy things. Let me read Isaiah to you. I'll just turn over. I, I tab mine, so I got ahead of you. Isaiah 5.20, the Bible says, Woe unto them, notice this verse, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. He said, How can I live holy? Call that which is right, right, and call that which is wrong, wrong. Amen. He said, How can I live a holy life? Honestly, how can I live in such a way that it's pleasing to God? Do that which is right, call that which is right, right, and call that which is evil, evil. Call it like it is. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, and that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. You know what's wrong with America? It's because they're getting their eyes off God and put their eyes on themselves. It's always according to that which man wants instead of which God wants. An unholy nation, an unholy group of people, an unholy church, an unholy Christian is those always running after what they want themselves instead of what God wants. How to be holy. The first one I want to give you, if you want to be holy, I've said it already, is to live near God. Live near a holy God. Right now somewhere, 1 Peter. Let me give it to you. 1 Peter chapter number... 14, verse 1, verse 14. 1 Peter 4, verse, excuse me, 1 Peter 1, verse 14. He says, as obedient children, notice that, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. He says, quit acting like you were lost. Remember before you knew the Lord Jesus as your Savior? You lived like the world. You did what they wanted you to do. You behaved like them. He says, stop doing that. He says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as ye have been, which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy, notice this, in all manner of conversation. That manner of conversation is your daily living. That's how you behave. That's how you respond. That's how you react to people. That's your daily living. If we would be conscious, and I'm here with you, if we would be conscious on a daily basis when circumstances come our way and situations arise, if we would just keep in mind that our God is holy, I want to do that which is right by Him, and God says my manner of conversation, my reaction to people, my behavior to people is always determining my relationship with God. You know, everything that you are involved in in life is a direct relationship with you and God. If you want to be holy, live around a holy God. As I said, these illustrations about fire and about a campfire and about certain smells in the garden, if you want to smell that way, get around it. One man said to be holy is not an attitude, but it's obedience to God. It's just simple obedience. I love when I studied a little bit about Jacob's life. You know, the Bible says Jacob had power with God. I love that expression. Jacob, the great 
patriarch of the nation of Israel. Jacob had the 12 sons and 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, that great man that God used to be Israel. God changed his name. You know the story I'm sure about Jacob and God chose Jacob of the nation of Israel out of the loins of Abraham. And so one day Jacob was wrestling with the angel. We, we believe that was the Lord Jesus. He was wrestling with, with, with the Lord that day. And the Bible says he touched, the, he touched the, the hollow of his thigh. And the Bible says he limped the rest of his day. Every day from that day forward, he had been with God. He had the power of God in his life. And he limped, I'm sure, every day the rest of his life. But he realized, I'd been with God. I'm going to tell you something. When you get around God and you get to live in a holy life toward Him, He'll make you walk different. He'll make you talk different. He'll make you act different. He'll make everything different. It's just like riding down the road and someone's in the car with you and being alone, if that individual is in the car with you, you act different because they're with you. Yeah. Proof of this. I've said this before. It's a great illustration. I love using it. Drive down the road. You're, sitting, you're going down the road and you see somebody sitting on the side of the road that has a set of blue lights on top of his car. <laughs> and your first reaction is what? Whoops. You may be going 20 miles an hour, but it's just an automatic reaction, isn't it? Because there's a police officer there, and I know that rascal will give me a ticket if I'm going over the speed limit. It's in us. It's in us to react to something that we know there's authority. There's, there's something in us that knows if we, if we get caught doing something we're not supposed to do, if we just know. Can I tell you, God is that one that causes us to want to do right. But often we don't want to live around God because it causes us to do right. We don't want to look in the mirror. We don't want to do that which is right because it goes against our nature. The devil wants us to serve him. There's a, there's a, a God in the world called little g God. And let me read it to you. And it's pretty simple because he tells us in 1 Corinthians 8, he says, no, listen to this verse. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 5, he says, For though... There be at our other gods, little g, there's other gods in the earth, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many, there's going to be a bunch of gods, but I love verse 6. He says, but to us, talking about Christian people, yeah. talking about you know, those that know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. He said, there's little gods out there, they're going to be pulling you, they're going to be tugging, they're going to be trying to get you out of the things of, of God and put you in unholy things. He said, but unto us, there's but one God. The Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we by Him. Yeah. Oh, he says, take the opportunity to get near God. Draw near where He's at. He said, you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Yes. God is a fair God, by the way. God will draw near you if you'll draw near Him. How to live holy is to live near a holy God. Another one I like to read to you is to read a holy book. Now, if you want to be filthy, read filthy information. Yeah. If you really, really want to read filthy things or be filthy, then read filthy magazines. If you want to be filthy in your lifestyle, you want to be filthy in your language, you want to be filthy, then you read filthy things. But God said if you want to be holy, you read a holy book. Yeah. I love this illustration, and I've said it dozens of times, but I just love this illustration. And I said this other week ago that folks been here for many, many years. They've heard all my stories. They've heard all my illustrations. They've heard all my jokes. I've got them numbered. Now, number 15, you just laugh, and we'll go right on. But I love the story with the little boy in the basket and, he, and, he, and, he, and he's full of holes, but he runs to the creek and he, he gets full of water and he runs back to his dad and it, it, it's empty. He's discouraged and he goes back to the water and he fills it back up again and water runs out before he gets back. The basket has holes in it. And he's so discouraged and he says it to his daddy. He says, Daddy, I cannot hold the water that it's in the basket. But he said, Yeah, but look how clean the basket is. He said, What's that mean? You read this book, you may not get it all, but I promise you this, God will let it soak through and it'll cleanse you as you read it. Amen. This book, listen to me here, will purge the unholy things that's in your life. I promise you it will. God designed it. He said it was a sword. 
He said it was a two-edged sword that would divide between the soul and the spirit and the marrows and the joints. He said, if you'll take this book, it's a holy book, by the way. He's very clear. Let me read it to you in case you're here and wondering if it's really a holy book. Let me read Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 2. It's a holy book. Verse number 1, verse number 2, he says, which he hath promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures. It's a holy book. We're reverence with this book. I, you know, I don't throw my Bible around. I don't set it on the floor. I know, I know this is just paper and I know it's just leather. But there's something about this book that's different to me. When, even when I carry it, if I even carry it in with a bunch of other books, I never put the Bible over, uh, under. I always put it over. You say, well, you're really fanatic about it. Well, I may be, but there's something about this book that's like no other book. There's something special about this book. The Bible says Jesus said his own self. He said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. This is the written word of God. You can eat it. The Bible says it's like bread. Job said that I desire it more than my sincere food. He said, I love this more than my food. Amen. If we treated this book like a meal, if we treated it like we need something from it. If we treated it like bread that it is, and we treated it like water like it is, if we treated it like, like light that it is, God would take it and carve out the unholy things of our life. How do you know lying's wrong? How do you know stealing's wrong? Because this book says it is. How do you know things are, are unholy? Because it is. Let, let me read 2 Timothy. I love this. Let, let me tell you what Paul did with his Bible. Paul, as you know, has been in prison. He was in prison most of his life after he would get caught uh, preaching the gospel. They would put him in prison. Here's what Paul said about the Bible. Paul's in prison, and he's asked Timothy, he says, Timothy, I'm in prison. I want you to bring three things when you come to visit me in prison. Here's what he said. He said, bring my cloak. That's his coat. He was cold, apparently. He had a physical need. Is his coat. He says, bring the cloak that I'm left in Troy. So he's in a prison in Troy with Carpus. When thou comest, bring with thee, I love this, and the books. So he apparently loved to read. So he wanted a jacket. He wanted a coke. He wanted a coat. He wanted his books. But I love this. I read this verse one day. And the Bible says, he says, but especially the parchments. You know what that is? That's this book. He says, I want you to bring a jacket. I'm cold. Bring me my books. I want to feed my mind. He said, but bring my book, the book, to feed my soul. I, wrote, I love that expression so much that I took and I am embossed it on my Bible because I never want to leave the fact that I can read. I love books. And I've got a whole bunch of them. I love to read books, but especially the parchments. That was his copy of the Word of God. You want to be holy? Live near a holy God. You want to be holy? Read a holy book. And the last one, if you'll live near a holy God and read a holy book, I promise you, according to this book, you'll live a holy life. There again, it's not arrogance. It's not your nose stuck up in the air. No, no. Matter of fact, I believe someone that's living a holy life will be full of humility. God says he will exalt those that will base themselves, those that will live, live humility. There again, if someone's holy, you won't have to ask them. He tells us to live a holy life. Back in our text, and by the way, could I say right now, 2018, is probably the easiest time to live a holy life? because it's so much unholiness. It's, it's really easy to be a real bright light today. It's really simple. Probably the easiest time of all of human history is the easiest time to be a bright light is today because it's so dark. We are living in these days of men of lovers at themselves and covetous boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, natural affection. Boy, that's a big one. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers, traitors, headed, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than loving of God, having a form of godliness from such turn away. But he tells us to live a holy life. I'll leave you with this verse, 2 Peter chapter 3. 
in verse number 11. Verse number 10 says, the day of the Lord's coming. You say, preacher, why should we live holy? It's all going to burn up anyway. Why? Because one of these days you're going to meet God. He says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you're not a Christian. With all the compassion I could tell you, you are living an unholy life. Because there's no way to be holy without Christ in your heart. It's, in, it's impossible. We're flesh. We're, we're, we're sinners by nature. We're sinners by birth. We're nothing but absolute sinners. There's no way sinners can be holy. The only part can be holy about you anyway is your spirit and soul. Your body, no doubt, can be a measure, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the inward part of your body, the inward side of you. By, uh, Psalm 51 says that he desires truth on the inward part. So much, let me say this, so much of church and church activity gets so, excuse me, stinking wrapped up with what the outside's doing. Amen. That's a bunch of hogwash. True. There's so much religious activity circling around the outside to the neglect of the inside. God desires truth on the inward part. God desires that the inward part of man be holy, not the outward part. The outward part will come. The outward part will, will, will adjust accordingly. It's the inward part that God desires. 2 Peter 3, verse number 11. He's coming a day. He's going to burn it all up. But why should we live holy? Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons you ought to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Amen. You're going to meet him. I don't want to stand before God dirty. I don't want to stand before God filthy. I don't want to stand before God not prepared. I want to stand before him holy. I honestly desire that. But it's not outward. God tells us in the book of Samuel that man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. That's very clear. We're not looking for the outward part. We're looking for the inward part. And may today be a day that we decide to be holy unto God, not unto man, unto God, because we're going to meet Him. I want to please Him. Just like every child ought to, have the desire to please his parent. You know, one of the discouraging things that I'm finding that children get discouraged over is because they seem to can never please their parents. Can I say this to parents, maybe, if it might be helpful? One of the most detrimental things you can do to your children is give them unrealistic expectation. If you are giving expectations to children that they can never reach, you're creating a failure, especially from parents because they can never achieve. They can never get there. They can never arrive. They can never make you proud. And it's always bad. It's always not what should be. Can I tell you what? God's not that way. God's not that way. He desires, yes. But he says, we're going to meet him one of these days. Oh, holy life should be sought from a holy God using a holy book. And let me say this, and I'll close. Being holy with God is not a one-day decision. It's a series of lifetime decisions. It's a process, if you will. You're not going to get up one day and just be holy. That's not going to work. It's a process. It's a lifetime of decisions. One of the things I'm learning as a Christian, God blesses. He said He would bless if we would be weary, if we would not be weary in well doing. For in due season, I'm learning. I've been now saved 20 years, almost 20 years. I'm learning. It's been 11 years here now at this church. I'm learning that God blesses in seasons. And what I mean by that is too many Christians give up on God too early and they never see the fruit of their labor. Amen. 
God blesses faithfulness. God blesses and, and gives the right measure, if you will, of blessings according to the faithfulness. You're not going to, like I say, you're not going to be holy overnight. But if you'll just determine to read God's book and keep drawing near Him, God will create it. I promise you. I've seen Him do it over and over and over. Let's pray together. Father, thank You.